Hello and welcome to day eight. Today, very, very, very important topic, digital decluttering. If you haven't noticed, the main currency of 21st century is no longer gold or paper dollars or even real estate. I would argue it is your focus, your attention, your time, your will. There are so many institutions, individuals, governments, companies that are relentlessly competing for your attention span. I wonder how much one minute of someone's attention is worth right now. It's probably somebody has to quantify this. And everything would be fine. Yeah, let them compete for my attention. But it is not easy to withstand the avalanche of information, notifications, and buzzes coming from every every direction. And we all know that many of them are quite addictive because people that design notification system and algorithms and interfaces of the sites and applications uh, use the psychology, if not psychiatry, to make us hooked up on all of those things. And I have noticed Actually, this week I went to do my dental cleaning, not the most pleasant procedure, it hurts a little bit and not, not something I would normally enjoy, but I actually did enjoy it because falling into a dental chair was so relaxing compared to sitting in the office and addressing several things at the same time and I thought, geez, this is exactly the topic I want to discuss, digital decluttering. So I came up with 30 pointers that um, I hope some of them you will find useful. This is what I do, this is what I know I should do, and I am sharing all of this here today. In order to make it more sizable, I split 30 into five categories, and I'll list the categories um, to you right now. Uh, one, economics, things that actually um, drain money and reducing those things, you will save money, like your bottom line. Uh, second big category, all kinds of distractions, all kinds of sneaky ways how to drain our focus and that will save you money, of course, but not as much as the first category, but focus and time. Number three, Facebook and Instagram, few points there. Number four, YouTube. And uh, last, number five category, just general, in general terms, uh, about setting up your boundaries. So, shall we? Number one, list all the devices you currently have and identify what was the original purpose. Why did you get this device? How is it adding to you? Can you live without it? Next time you have to replace your MacBook Air or your iPhone, would you, would you do this? And I get it that you would probably not be able to live today without your phone and desktop computer or laptop, but maybe you can find a way not to have an iPad, an iPod, uh, an iPhone, a desktop computer, a couple of uh, Windows-based uh, uh, PCs, maybe you can streamline them a little bit. Last year, my MacBook Air broke, and guys, without, without even thinking, I ran to Apple Store and I didn't have um, cash at the moment, so I paid by a credit card. Without even thinking, I thought, okay, if if I don't have money by the end of the month, I'll just transfer money from line of credit, and I can't live without my machine. I'm I'm so I was so 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 addicted to my laptop, my MacBook Air, because let's uh, let's agree, let's all agree, it's a superb superb machine but what this machine had become over the years it became my extension became my my arm my eyes my vision actually got way worse because i was always on it uh, especially when i was traveling i slept with machine by watching youtube by playing with different applications and now almost a year without it i actually feel better my vision got better and I'm glad I made the I made this choice and created a challenge for myself. Yes, a few times it wasn't that easy. Now, if I want to do anything, uh, which is banking or 
creation or, or anything, what have you, I actually have to be in my office to set myself up and boy, boy, way more productive this way. And there's no laptop in my bed anymore and I'm not sleeping with it on my couch. Number two, list all, all the social media platforms you are currently using and the same process, just assess how useful they are. I did this exercise and I realized that I had to kill my LinkedIn account. It was not only useless, it actually was detracting from my life because somehow it synchronized all, all, all the contacts I had on LinkedIn with my phone and it freaked me out. A couple of years ago, we had a family emergency and I needed to call Stephen and his phone at the time was completely unmemorizable. And so I was looking, scrolling, looking for his uh, contact and his last name is Hanstock. And I had Hendersons and Hanses and Howards, you name it. I had all kinds of ages, but not my beloved husband. It freaked me out. Most of these people that were popping up and imagine we're dealing, we're talking emergency. I didn't even know what these companies and these people were and deleting them from the contact list wasn't helpful at all. They were re-emerging each time I was, I guess, synchronizing with LinkedIn without even knowing. So I think somehow, somewhere, I probably clicked on check button when I was setting up my LinkedIn account that allowed for this to happen. And frankly speaking, after 10 years on the platform, the only, the only contacts I got, people that wanted to sell me something, people wanted me to hire them, people want to defraud me, and I never got any, any, anything, not even a single, single client from it. So I made a decision, took time, killed my account, I don't want to have it anymore. Facebook. Facebook started as a platform to find your classmates and now it evolved into so much more than that. I don't uh, look for friends anymore, actually curbing my friend count to, uh, to a minimum. But hey, Facebook Messenger, that's an amazing, amazing feature to be able to be able to calling anybody internationally for free and send them pictures and uh, small videos. It's uh, absolutely amazing. And Facebook Marketplace alone is, is is crazy good. I sell a lot of things that I no longer need on Facebook Marketplace. And I, I sometimes buy things I need at a very, very low cost. So Facebook stays, link that goes. I suggest you do the same, uh, same process with your platforms and uh, only keep things that truly, truly add to your life. Number three, list all paid subscriptions and delete them mercilessly because all these two dollars and four dollars and five dollars and six dollars, they all add up. And if you quantify uh, how much you will spend in the next five, 10 years on something that you may not even be using, it is scary. It's thousands of dollars, not even hundreds. So critically assess what you no longer need. And uh, I would suggest uh, just go through your bank statement and credit card statement and see what, who are these culprits and just get rid of them. Because let's say you have 10 subscriptions to 10 good, amazing magazines. I'm not saying their crap. I'm just saying that you cannot read 10 articles in one hour at the same time. And even if you do, you probably would not retain anything you just read. It would be totally meaningless. Therefore, sometimes we end up reading none because we don't know which one to choose. This is good, this is good, this is even better. And then you end up saying, you know what, just forget it, not doing it, but I'll, I'll do something else. Number four, I think if you have any digital assets and update your estate folder. Why? Because as we progress, uh, people actually ac accumulate digital assets. I would be an example of iTunes library. I, I was using iTunes and purchasing music for more than 10 years now. And I bet that my, it's worth something. Some people have developed and well-marketed YouTube channels. It might be worth something. 
I'm not a specialist in digital assets, but I know for sure that it's becoming now a significant part of anyone's financial planning. Uh, number five, as I mentioned, I use iTunes and I, I'm, I'm actually pissed off at iTunes. They made it so difficult to navigate and they are constantly, constantly bugging me to use a Apple Music so that I pay monthly subscription, which I don't want to pay because I want my music, I spend a lot of money and I rotate what I like and I redo my playlist. I don't want Apple Music. But they, 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 they push, 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 and uh, it's really annoying. And what I've noticed is some of the albums that I know I, I had are no longer visible on, in my library. So I had to call Apple support and 45 minutes later, second level support, person in my phone, somebody in my, in my desktop trying to see what's going on. 45 minutes later, they found this bloody album and reinstated it through purchase history. Nothing is intuitive. It wasn't easy to find the path, how to find it. So what I am doing right now, I am actually dragging those physical files into my external hard drive storage. I have this big, big thing under my computer. And once a week, I just go five albums, 10 albums and just drop there these files and I organize my library the way I know I'll be able to find something. Let's say music from my school years, music from my first years of immigration to Canada. So I, I created a hierarchy that represents my life. And if I feel nostalgic and I want to listen to Vanessa Paradis, for example, I know I, where to look for it. Where now, if I'm going and trying to search those physical files, sometimes iTunes library uh, have <laughs> tons of stuff under compilations and I just want to say hello. <laughs> That's not helpful. It's, it's not user-friendly, not, not anymore. So if you're like me, the owner of a large musical library, I suggest you drag and drop it somewhere where you can find it easily and you're not dependent on artists re-releasing the album, hence it will drop off from your music library and possibly you will even have to repurchase it and how unfair is that, right? All right, number six, consider going um, no data, no data and uh, just have basic phone services on your phone and you will see huge rewards. Uh, in Canada, data is uh, criminally expensive. And I kind of understand it, that you have to have these towers across a vast, vast territory like Canada, and our population is only 30 million, so it kind of makes sense that it's expensive. But the bottom line is that it is expensive. I stopped uh, using data on my phone seven or eight years ago, never looked back. More and more places today have Wi-Fi, and if I need to look something up, I look it up, and I don't need to use data when I'm driving because that saved me probably a lot of traffic tickets. I actually got one ticket about 10 years ago. On the first day of school, I was checking where Mark's, Mark is my son, bus was, it was super urgent, and police knocked on my window and gave me $360 ticket. That was a good reason to dump data okay uh seven if you consider uh going off data and save 100 bucks every month and bet uh, between me and steven it's more than 200 so that's a vacation per year like 2500 dollars i we save in one year going data free and if you want to listen to your books offline then have, uh, have them downloaded. Some books are not readable through Audible, so there's an application, which I really, really like, that plays MP3 books that you downloaded somewhere else. It's phenomenal, really well set up. I use that. And Maps, uh, that's number eight. Uh, maps is actually pretty cool. If I knew that you don't need data, 
<laughs> don't need data to have map in your car because somehow a GPS in a car reads directions. There is another application that needs data, but uh, find the one on your phone that would work without any data. But what I know that when it's not your local local place where you live, you have to, you may have to download maps, and they drop off too after a certain time. So if you are planning to go to Paris tomorrow, before you go, just download Paris map. Number nine, I prefer not to transact uh, financially on my phone and I deleted the wallet. I do have online banking because I, when I get this funny checks and mail for $20, $30, I keep thinking, why would somebody bother to do this work? It could probably cost more money to process all this. I like the feature that does e-deposit by just snapping picture of your check, pretty cool. So I'm a sucker for that, but uh, when when my bank CIBC tells me, oh, just download the app and you can see your statement, no. I want to do my banking, my financial transactions, my investing mindfully. I want to be in front of my computer in old fashioned office with all my resources, with my focus, and don't tell me to use online banking unless I'm traveling and it's absolutely, um, there is no other way. I probably will download the application, do it, and then delete it. So I don't do any financial stuff on my phone. And number 10, uh, before you proceed uh, changing things, just out of curiosity, go to your uh, to go to the settings on your devices and find the screen time screen time option that will tell you how much you are sp how much time you're spending on your phone it might be quite shocking if you're spending maybe an hour maybe two hours a day uh, maybe not that concerning but I know that my late mother was spending 16 hours a day on iPad and I think it largely contributed to her dementia and her losing her mind because 16 hours on iPad, that's, um, that's very grim. Next category, distractions, number 11. Go to your phone and uncheck all the notifications and then only check the ones that are truly, truly, truly indispensable. Web browser, the same thing. It was so annoying up to maybe last year that I would be in the middle of a client's file or in the middle of the conversation and then breaking news, this happened, this happened, and CNN, how the heck it was accessing my desktop. So I found a way to go to a web browser settings. I found a way where you can just uncheck those notifications. There were a bunch of sites that probably made themselves there by themselves somehow and I unchecked all of them. I don't need any distractions. I cannot help an earthquake somewhere and I need to help my particular client that I'm currently working with and I have to do my job and I cannot be distracted. Number 12. At some point I stopped answering my phone because I get automatic machines calling me I get uh, somebody who impersonates themselves as Canada Revenue Agency. I get, of course, duct cleaners and simply people that want something from me. I actually sometimes happy when the real people call, even though they try to get some <laughs> something out of me, because most of the time they're not even real people, they're machines. And again, it's a distraction of a distraction. So I put my phone on do not disturb mode and I use it to make outgoing calls or uh, if there is anything pre-arranged and I know uh, you will be calling me at such a time, of course I will be by the phone to be able to talk to you. But other than that, I don't answer the phone. I don't have an assistant to filter my calls and most people don't today, it's very expensive. So my voice message is saying that, hey, I'm there for you, but uh, I'm not answering the phones because of this crazy reasons, uh, all these people calling me, bugging me, I can't do my work, please email me and we'll set up the phone call conversation if uh, needs be. I was very inspired by one lady that I hired to do staging for an apartment we were selling 
and her voicemail was pretty cool she was checking her messages i think twice a week tuesdays and thursdays something like this and i thought way to go girl and that was quite uh, shocking because um, today's world expects you to respond almost instantly to to anything uh, back in my CIBC days, we we had automatic email responses. I'll get back to you within two hours. Crazy! What if you are in a meeting with a client for two hours? Then you won't even have time to think what what the email was all about. So I measure my potential clients' expectations. Or anybody who calls me, I spell out my email address and just say, "Email me. What's what's the deal?" And um, we'll set up the conversation. If I am waiting for a phone call from Steven usually. I put it back on disturb me because it's my husband and he has every right to disturb me. Number 13, implement zero inbox or zero email inbox policy. And I use the rule of four Ds, which I learned from priority course. It was a course that was face to face with amazing, amazing gentleman, Andy Andy Sherwood. He he was running the course, and I was um, very lucky to attend it. He taught us the rule of four Ds, and the rule is this: when you get an email, either you delete it right away. You, you do it if it's within 40 seconds, some quick question, something yes or no answer, and doesn't re require you to do any research, any thinking, any extensive responsing. Just do it right away, because if you do it right away, it will save you time later by not thinking about it. And this traffic in your mind, like, oh yeah, this little email, I have to respond, oh, and this other one, and this other one. No, it's if you compare the buzz you will be getting from this little email, it's far more than immediate response that will take you 40 seconds. So just do it and move on. The third D is delegate. My husband, Stephen, is really good with that. He always delegates things to me and I have to do them. And then if you can't delegate, if you can't delete, if you can't do it right away, just copy the whole body of this message and date it. Put it on your calendar when you will attend to it. it that it will look like an appointment. Because we tend to put appointments on our calendars and uh, that is misleading because we do a lot of our work and it looks like we do nothing, but we actually do a lot. And what I also... Uh, learned on the priority course uh, conver to convert emails into tasks and appointments. I don't like tasks list because it's not date specific. I like taking something. I know Wednesday morning I have time. So I'll cut and paste into an appointment and I know that there is something I need to do. So delete, do, delegate and date. If you're using Microsoft Outlook, uh, please use those folders on the site and create as many as you need, as many as you like. I like to keep my main folders to, uh, maximum three or five, so I'm not distracted with 20 folders because then it's difficult to see what, what is what. And those three is my hobby, my hobby project, such as this, for example. A best self guide is my hobby, my main work of business, and my lifestyle and my day to day activities. Within those main folders, of course, I have a whole tree with branches in every direction of all kinds of subfolders where I keep the information. But at the glance, I like to keep things to a minimum of three, maybe five, maybe five. All right, um, number 15 uh, has to do with uh, zero email policy. Unsubscribe. Please take time to unsubscribe from everything you don't want to see. Why? Because, yes, unsubscribing will take you more seconds than just deleting it, but this email will come again and maybe more. And deleting email is not just clicking on it. Deleting email is 
a, a, a chain of certain executive decisions that you make very quickly, but you are distracted by it. You have to think about it very quickly, even if you can. You may have to look into it. And it takes, not time-wise, it may take just a couple of seconds, but if you think of your brain and focus as a currency, it probably took 100 bucks of your life by doing this because you have to make a decision to delete it. And of course, you can accidentally, in haste, delete something you don't want to delete and realize it too late. So why create a problem of this decision making and accident that you may delete actually important email? Just unsubscribe. And when somebody can't, uh, when somebody doesn't have the unsubscribe button, I'm very very pissed off at these kind of uh, senders. I just block them or I report them as spam or phishing or whatever. All right, my next. Um, suggestion number 16 organize your iphone screen so that it's uh, less distracting i still see people whose iphone screen is covered with tapestry of icons i don't know how can you navigate through all that effectively so i like to organize different applications into folders for example all photo editing applications and Instagram are united in one folder and I actually call it journalism. So when I want to do it, I know everything that can make a collage or text over photo or Prisma that can convert picture into a painting. It's all together with Instagram by theme because I'm using this to, to, to make my posts. And I went a step further. I, not only I united little apps and mercilessly, mercilessly deleted everything I wasn't using for a while, but I also chose that the default screen, the one that you see right away when you open your phone, is what is the most important thing for me, which at the moment, uh, learning French, so I have my Duolingo app, reading books, so I have my Audible and MP3 book, and music. When I'm in the car, I like to listen to YouTube music or I like to listen to podcasts. So all the things that make me smarter, or more educated and something I want to do is in the screen. Not Facebook, not Instagram. Anything fun I organized on the right side. You know, when you swipe your screen, you get to another screen. So to the right, all fun stuff like Facebook and Instagram and to the left all work stuff access to files a cam scanner some stocks reports things like that that i use for work and it sets my brain into a really good groove that here's my default position i want to read more i want to practice french i want to do these these things i'll go to the right i have fun i go to the left i have work so i don't have everything commingled and at the same time I'm not distracted by my fun applications at the moment I open my phone. All right, uh, number 17. Uh, I suggest you to do a similar thing with your desktop. Please, when you have the tapestry of all kinds of icons, it's so tiring because you have to strain your eyes to find the right one. Okay, number 18. Uh, curate your internet favorites. I use Google Chrome, I use Safari too, uh, but mostly I use Google Chrome. And there is this bar on the top that has sites that you frequently use. I like putting things that I should be going to, and most of them are work-related. It adds to the efficiency, it actually is very professional when I click on that without Googling them, and uh, no fun. The next category, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I had about 1,200 contacts on my Facebook. And uh, once I needed somebody to confirm my residency in Canada, and I realized there were only three people that I could safely call and say, hey, Masha, hey, Natasha, can you please uh, do this for me? And out of the 1,200 people, I 
I would be embarrassed to ask them for this favor or they would not know me that well. And I thought, why bother even having those people on my list if um, I'm not in touch with them? So I limited my contact count to friends count on Facebook to 50. Some people actually got offended. They thought, oh, well, you may unfollow me, but stay friends with me. But if I'm not interested in your posts, you would not know I'm not aware of what's going on with you. Why wouldn't I be honest and just tell you that? Look, it just happened the way that we are not in touch and I cannot be distracted and I'm not following you and I don't want to give an impression that I am your friend because I'm not. And oftentimes people make this choice themselves. I would reach out to them once, twice and they're always busy and they don't respond and talk. So you just, you just have other things to do. That's fine. But when I limited the amount of my friends, it actually gave me, gave me liberty with my time not to react to other people's posts, posts because I have to. Oh, nice house. Oh, nice yacht. Oh, nice outfit. I don't care. But I do care for about 50 people. Um, some of them don't care for me, but I find them inspiring. So I, I follow them and I look at their posts. But I want to follow people that I really want to follow. And if I uh, put a message or a comment, I want it to be a bit more interesting, meaningful, and show this person that I actually was thinking about them, that I wanted to contribute my opinion. And I think it's pretty cool. That's what Facebook was supposed to be. Uh, reciprocally, I did not want a real estate agent from uh, from neighboring town constantly saying, hey, we need to go to Tiara, that's cool, because they want to sell me something from their inventory or sell my house. I don't want the fake enthusiasm. Uh, I use my Facebook, that's number 20, as a kind of instant album. You remember how our parents and grandparents used to slap pictures and put notes? Uh, this is what I do, maybe not once a year, maybe twice or three times a year, or after any significant trip. I put 20, sometimes 60 pictures, and I put a bit, a little blurb, because I know I will forget, and maybe one day I'll just revisit this, and I will spend time making an album, but most of the times that we don't have time for this, but at least I know that on my timeline within Facebook, I can go to 2021, 2022 and pick up those albums and see what was going on with my life. I find Facebook incredibly convenient for this. And from time to time, actually, artificial intelligence of Facebook spits out pre-made albums that are made of your posts and they're pretty cool. Not exactly how I would like to make it, but hey, it's done for you. You pay 60, 80, 100 dollars and you get actual book that you can keep uh, keep at home. Number 21, I, uh, I put stuff on Instagram in linear fashion, day one, day two, and it represents almost like a diary, what I'm doing, during the month. Sometimes I delete those things later, but it's an accountability tool for me. And some people find it interesting and inspiring. I have maybe three likes here and there, and that's great. I'm happy for that. Number 22. Uh, now we are into YouTube. I like YouTube subscription. As much as I hate every other subscription, I realize that I can't live without YouTube subscription for premium because I cannot be distracted by commercials. Number 23, uh, when you surf on YouTube, you will find something about politics, something about finance. Create those smart focused playlists, not just the playlist to watch later because you'll have thousand episodes sitting there, but uh, try to compartmentalize your interests and um, save those videos to watch later when you have this leisure time, leisure hour, you can just open your playlist and okay, that's that's what I want to um, watch right now. I have a Boho Beautiful 30 episodes that I like and I just name them day one, day two, day three. And today, for example, is September 6th, so number six 
I do my 20 minute yoga class right at home and I don't have to think where I go, <laughs> what I choose. I know it's number six on my playlist. That's going to be my class for today. Now I would uh, even suggest downloading some episodes so that you have an actual video file if you want to use it as a reference or come later. I wish I downloaded this YouTube episode when Bank of Canada said they were not going to raise interest rates. I only wish, but uh, now it's gone. You can't find it. It's deleted from YouTube. It could be something deleted for political reasons or just content creator said, you know, how with all of you, <laughs> just leaving, you're not going to see my videos anymore. For this, I have a Wonder Share Converter program. It, uh, it is selling for something like $80 for perpetual license. I haggled with them and got it for $60 and it downloads episodes in seconds. So when I have my favorite Boho Beautiful Yoga episode, I call the file day one, day two, day three, and I store it in my little USB stick or on my external hard drive. And if one day Juliana decides that she doesn't want to have all this free content, I will have her videos forever because I cherish them very, very much. Now, when you have your playlists, when you download something from YouTube, I uh, would say curate your subscriptions. Don't just subscribe to 200 places because you won't be able to address all of that. Occasionally, just keep your list refreshed. If you haven't done so, consider uh, making your own YouTube channel. I have obviously my own YouTube channel and I like keeping my stuff organized within my channel. So when I browse YouTube and find different videos and I create playlists, then when I am there to watch what I've saved, I don't start from the homepage. It's too distracting. I definitely will be sidetracked by all kinds of things YouTube is suggesting me and clicking and saying, don't suggest this to me. I'm not interested. Well, they'll suggest something else and it's never ending. What I do immediately when I log in, I actually jump into my own channel and then I see everything nice and neat, just like kitchen cupboards everything organized the way I like it and I have my playlist on the side and if I feel like listening to political news or chilling with yoga and your own channel which is absolutely free will allow you to use and use YouTube and consume content on your terms. Now we are in the last category and let's set up boundaries, personal boundaries uh, with and 27 is uh, list all the places uh, that will not allow any screens. For example, bedroom. Uh, well, we use um, our phones in the bedroom primarily for music and sometimes I like to listen to an audiobook, but I try to not use it at all if possible and after nine it's non-negotiable. All phones physically go to a kitchen countertop and stay there for the night. Now let's set up uh, times that will be a no phone policy and our times are meals and we always kindly ask our guests, our children, please please guys don't use your phone and it's so pathetic when you pass by a restaurant and you see people spending hundreds of dollars for meals today and each person is looking into their phone. At 29, uh, set up an alarm uh, for your internet usage. And last but not least is um, don't be afraid that something might be not convenient and can create a bit more work. It, it, it cannot be that so convenient that you always need an app to tell you which which is your right arm which is your left arm sometimes you have to plug in your brain and do a bit of creative thinking critical thinking there's nothing wrong with that so don't be afraid of making your life a little bit more complex and a little bit harder because all this convenience will make us cuckoos at some point 
And the last point, uh, memorize the phone numbers of your loved ones so that if there is an emergency and you have to dial it from police, um, the police phone, you at least would not be embarrassed and you would remember your husband, your wife, your kids' phone numbers. We used to remember, what, 15 numbers easy when we were growing up in 70s and 80s and now we don't even remember one. Come on. All right, I'm done and thank you for staying with me. See you in the day night. Bye for now.